Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast. You're here with uh, all of us, all three of us today, and we're going to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, at least my heart. I know also uh, Peaches and Aaron care a lot about it. But before we start, I just want to thank you for subscribing. And uh, I've already thanked you, so don't, you can't make it weird. You can't not subscribe now because I already thank you. So don't don't put me into a like socially awkward situation. I'm awkward enough as it is. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Do everybody a favor and uh, let's jump right into it day to day. It's a it's a question that we've gotten maybe one once or twice. What's the day to day like at the the unit, the job, all those other things? Aaron, you wanna you wanna start out with uh what's what's your day to day like or or transition to whatever you want to talk about because that's what happens when I ask people questions. <laughs> that's right. You know what? Uh, I'm I'm not gonna answer the question you asked me. I'm gonna <laughs> answer the question that I wish you did. We should just make a throwback episode. You know when sitcoms don't have enough ideas and they make a clip show. I feel like this is a clip show. You're like, what? what's the day-to-day like, right? And then I used a quote from a previous podcast. I think we're off to a clip show really well. It's called a yeah, throwback yeah. in the old biz. <laughs> the old biz, biz, baby. That's right, well, baby. That's right, baby. Well, we wanted – I know it's a joke. Like, I know we joke about, oh, what's the day-to-day like? Because we get the question constantly. But we were talking about it. A ton of stuff has changed. We're getting three level controllers to the two series units now. That's never happened before. We're training three level PJs at the unit before. So really your day to day has changed a ton and it's changed all the way in the pipeline. So Trent, I would answer your question with a question. What do you want to talk about? Pipeline or you want to talk about at the unit the day to day? This is unfair. You can't throw it back at me. I threw it over to you. You got to throw it over to Peaches before it comes back to me. Like there's a rotation. (laughs) Like we had we had structure and now it's chaos. I don't know what to do. We should have well, an outline. Let's go chronological then. How about in the pipeline? Okay. Okay. Chronological. So in the pipeline, we're gonna we're gonna spend a whole episode on uh, special warfare operator enlistment vector. We're gonna talk about how to be a stud in the development program. That's coming. No kidding. We're recording it ASAP. So let's just talk about the pipeline. Uh, you're gonna show up to basic training. That's still the same. You're gonna show up to your AF spec war flight. That's still the same. Then when you get done, you're going to go to the special warfare candidate course. Okay. Special warfare candidate course. It's called SWIC. There's no more prep, right? It's called SWIC. You take the initial fitness test a bunch of times in your development. You'll take it again when you get to SWIC. And then SWIC is completely revisioned. There is a lot more input from cadre at SWIC. They used to have two or three people maybe. And now Trent, how many cadre they got running around SWIC? I know six, six, eight, six, eight. Wow. It depends. Opsec. There's, there's like that constant a like, uh, failed. moving around of, of cadre. So like you got to understand that like the 350th, the squadron out there has a whole bunch of courses and a whole bunch of requirements. And every time that someone PCS is in or PCS is out, people are going to move around. So it's not like a solid state um, course, you know? So if I answered right today and I was actually right about how many people are there, by the time we dropped this episode, it'd be incorrect. And then, you know, Spencer <laughs> would be calling me being like, why are you so re-? I'd be like, I don't know. Man. <laughs> and then why, why are you just lying to everybody? Because right, there's yeah. obviously more than six or less than six. And you we owe me an answer. Active so. duty instructors at SWIC right now. <laughs> yes. That would be amazing. Actually do that. With, what and an sc- absolute scary. circus. Scary. Yeah, yeah it's, it's exactly. So y'all ask for mentors, Swick, it's one student per one cadre. That would be, yeah. <laughs> you get a one-to-one ratio. You yeah. get assigned. Uh, hello, Airman Johnson. This is uh, Trent Segmiller. He is your SR guy. He, I'm issuing him to you and you can't lose him. And that's going to be hard because he gets distracted. I do. Shiny things. <laughs> so the uh, Swick has changed a bunch, right? Like when it used to be prep and we used to do all these things, we didn't know what was working. You have to try these things. They're an iterative process. And now we're really hitting our stride for how it is that we best prepare people. We're adding stress events into SWIC. They're doing things that are more like you're going to do uh, at ANS. You're still getting that great input from the instructors. So your day-to-day is wake up, train with the coaches. Maybe you get tagged for a detail. Don't scurve. Actually, I'm kidding. I, scurving is my favorite game. Uh, I don't know how... the. Do you, have we ever talked about what scurving is? No, th- I was just about to say, why don't you explain scurving? Oh, man, this is it's great. This is a great hard, one take a hard day left turn. It is. Listen, if you're an E4 below the E4 mafia, the army calls it shaming, like you're shaming out of work. Um, the Air Force, we call it scurving. Okay. I don't know where the word comes from. I think it's a, uh, you know, a 
combination of other words that we just sort of appropriated. But here's the deal. Are you, did you tell your sergeant that you're going over to dental and really you're sitting at the mini mall drinking a shake, trying not to be seen by anybody you know? You are scurving. Were you supposed to clean your room and instead you slept underneath it uh, while you made your bed and then slept underneath it? So even if somebody poked their head into your room, they couldn't see you sleeping in the middle of the duty day under your bed. You're a scurve. Now, this does translate to ANS. OK, is everybody else doing push ups and you can see the cadre? And you know which way the cadre is looking and it's not at you. And you're counting one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two. You are scurving. Now, cautionary tale. If I catch you scurving, and I, I know what scurving looks like. It's a Guys, gamble. We, it's a gamble. Listen, it, there's a give and take between the, the cadre and the students. If I catch you scurving, I'm going to smoke you to death. Maybe not to death. But may, just maybe just short of it, just real close, because that's the game. You try to get away from me, but if you get caught, sorry, you're, you're done. All right. I don't know why we got on scurving, but no, oh, no, no. it's wait, the day-to-day -day life. Real quick, real quick with, with scurving, because it, it brings me, the smoke session thing brings me up. Yes. I got a question the other day that said, um, hey, I just had my first uh, first session with a development or with a developer. And... I'm, I'm so sore. Like he smoked us so bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the question was, how could it, you guys talk about how much pain, more painful it can be and, and how much worse it is in a pipeline than it is with a developer. And he's like, how could that possibly be? And I was like, Oh, boo boo. <laughs> I was like, there's a lot of reasons. I was like, oh, boo -boo. Just for one, we could just make it last longer. I could just um, keep going. Was, and then I was like, but he goes, so all it is is just making it last longer. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. How about last longer? The intensity, weight increase, adding things to you when you're in the pool, um, be, uh, like add fatigue, add, you know, starvation, add like, I was like, dude, I'll keep going. Like I will yeah. not stop. It will get terrible for you. And you have no idea. How does it get worse? Oh, bro, oh, man, they don't know bless what they you, don't know. Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you do it? Question. What, what do you think that the cadre talk about when you're not around? They come up with <laughs> new and ways make. to make your life miserable without actually breaking your bones. Because that we get in trouble I've, for. I, <laughs> I, I'm not going to. Oh, I, I, I almost started talking about uh, Trent. Do you remember the motivational training matrix? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to tell anybody what that is, but let me let me just tell you something. <laughs> there is a way, even with specific exercises, there is a way where I could line those exercises up to where even though the volume is not great, the smoke is insane, right? For instance, one of my favorite things to do, the transition from flutter kicks to bear crawls in a grass and gorillas environment. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what you don't understand. If you can get all the blood out of your legs, and essentially if you, if you can do this on a hill, so where your feet are pointed uphill and your head is pointed down. Um, if you can just get those legs above the shoulders, really, you know, those uh, above the hips. And if you can get the hips a little high, all that blood goes all the way up to the head. And then where's your head go on a bear crawl? It goes lower than your hips, right? Because that's the standard for the bear crawl. You know how quickly that sucks? It's pretty much immediate. I, uh, I use that little trick on one of my favorite, uh, favorite crows teams down in San Antonio when we went afoul of some of our standards. And I, I think I was about a quarter of the people would puke just off the transition, like just off of the getting up into that, that head we're down position. Now that's how it can get worse. My guy is there's a bunch of masochists sitting in a room. Like how can we organize these specific exercises to be the worst? Yep. There you yep. go. And I how totally derailed this, but like, yeah, that was a question. And I was just, I couldn't help but laugh at it when I'm like, how bad could it get? Well, Boy, well, and, let me and tell you. Maybe if his developer isn't making him do everything correctly, and when it's a team exercise, the reps don't count unless the entire team does it exactly the way that I showed you, you know, together, and they sound off together. So, like, you, it, it might say ten reps. You might end Man, up I, doing a few more yeah. attempts yeah. than ten. Oh yeah, we only need and to you, do five. And you right, make guys. them slower and more isometric and stuff. Oh boy. Oof. Yeah. I, I actually wish I may have to try and find that DM and ask who his developer is. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm curious now. 
you you know what you should you know what we should do we should get a developer on that would be really dope we should get a developer on and they could tell us about that's why we always start at a and s is because we're not really ready and we know a lot of recruiters they come on all the time but nobody in between no developers we'll find one we'll find one that wants to come on <laughs> however Peach, you did a great job of wrapping up. That's the day-to-day in SWIC. You're just trying to survive, baby. You're yes. going to training. You're working with the coaches. Maybe you scurve. Maybe you get a little schnooze out of it. I'm not mad at it. Again, that's the game. We've all done it. And then you get to a and uh, Trent, where, can you give me some real-time information just to put it out there? Where are people declaring their career field? Is it in SWIC now or is it prior to them entering SWIC? You do it at, at SWIC and then when you show up okay. to A&S. So there, there, you have a few different um, time frames. I think the first time you do it is actually in BMT, but we let you like change your mind as you get more briefings and you're exposed to more cadre and all those types of things. Um, nice. But I, I want to say awesome. coming out of SWIC, there are a few things that you need to have learned before you go to ANS, like how to set up the pool. There's there's some very important things that you need to learn and that you need to not forget in the transition from SWIC to ANS because you will be held accountable for those. You and you your team. Held accountable for everything. I mean, that's, yeah, but I mean, it, it's, it's more than just surviving there, there, and you'll see there, there are critical things that you absolutely need to get right to give your team a better chance of, you know, more people making it through ANS. Nice. And that is, so, you know, all kidding aside, what, what does your day to day look like in SWIC? Y'all should just be hyper-focused setting the pool up recovery sleep. I know we make jokes about, you know, going to the mini mall and having a protein shake. Of course, you're going to have time for yourself. Of course, you're going to have time to engage. You're going to have your grid time. You're going to be able to go on the interwebs um, and leave us silly questions or tell us we're wrong about stuff. But really, you should be focused on getting ready for ANS because ANS is your next step, right? So, you know, getting your, your fitness up to standard so that you can smoke that candidate fitness test, that CFT that you're going to take at SWIC. And then you're off to the races over to A&S. So any, any saved rounds on, on what's a day-to-day like in a, in a SWIC cone? Uh, go watch the episode about IFT, CFT, OFT. Yeah, yeah. please. And use the right names. We, you guys are so quick. I, I'm going to post the Powerpuff Girl meme after this, but it's, it's the girl that's looking all sweet and cuddly. And it's like, you know, you, when, when you get a word wrong, you know, that's how we treat you. And then it's like the, the same girl, she's just super mad. And it's like how you treat us when we dare say something incorrect. Like you'll call us on it right away. We give you the grace of being like, oh, they don't know. And then we get something wrong. You're like, you guys are idiots. These guys don't know what they're talking about. Which is know that we've gotten one of those for the pipeline yet. I'm sure. Which I'm one? I'm sure we have. Oh, oh yeah. Us being wrong about the pipeline. Oh yeah, yeah. The tech P, come on, the tech P uh, okay, pipeline yeah, yeah. training line. Come oh, on, yeah. just have him. Get out of here in your face. You sure? That's you sure, Peaches. Yeah. You know. sure you don't want to follow up? You want to correct <laughs> yourself, Chief? <laughs> you don't want to double down on this? You don't want to double down on that? Yeah, sure I do. Um, <laughs> and that brings You're us right, to ANS. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, ANS is a hurricane. You know what your day to day is? Your your day to day is you are here to perform. You should be thinking about nothing else. Uh, now retired chief master sergeant Robbie Bean. He was one of my proctors way back in the day. And he would, he would tell us about dreaming about training. If you are not dreaming about training, sometimes it's nightmares. Sometimes you just wake up and you're like, I don't know, but we had to swim through jello. And they're like, uh, chief Bean told a hilarious, like uh, a hilarious story about he was dreaming one time and we call it seeing the wizard. Uh, if you have a shallow water blackout in the communities, we call it seeing the wizard, right? It's a joke, it, but you can see it. It's everywhere in selection and assessment. Um, you can see it around seeing the wizard. Um, but <laughs> chief Bean used to tell a very funny story of when he was trying to get to the wall on a couple of his last really hard interval underwaters, he saw an actual wizard, but it had a really weird voice and he'd say, Oh, come on, chief Bean. Or, come on, Robbie Bean, you can make it. And he would dream about that. And he was such an animated guy that at breakfast, he'd be like, I had the dream again. And the wizard was there and he was telling me to come on and I couldn't make it. Um, so the day to day, you should be so involved that you're dreaming about training. Do you guys have anything valuable for this? God, I just sit here Is thinking about Robbie Bean doing that. It is. Come on, buddy. Yeah. Oh, you can come make on, it. Come on. Get those come creamy on. hamstrings over here. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, come on, come on, Robbie. You're not going to pass out this time. Yeah. Come into my welcoming arms. 
I'm telling you, that's the voice he would make, and he hilarious. I, and I that used was to before make him, Family Guy. That what one hundred percent like that was the voice that he used. Like he is the guy um, that made that up. But all jokes aside, A and S day to day show up to the event ready to train. So never light, never late, never lacking. Right. So never light and equipment have everything you're supposed to have. Never late, never you're always on time, and then never lacking motivation or the prerequisites for that training event. Right. So have all your equipment, be on time, and then make sure that you're actually prepared for the event. And after that, it's just, it's a mobility game of attrition, right? You were just going to absolutely do everything you can. Finally, maybe mentioning Chief Bean kind of jogged my memory, but you're going to have cravings for other foods. I'm one of those guys, like there's no such thing as a diet at a It's just, it's just calories. I used to just crave vegetables and salt. So, you know, with my dinner, I would eat my normal dinner and I would have a big bowl of whatever vegetable, you know, mixed vegetables or green beans. And I'd put butter and salt on those bad boys. I don't know why, but it just always made me feel better. Right. Wasn't usually a huge part of my diet before, but there's no such thing as a diet there. Eat the best food, the best fuel that you possibly can. But sometimes you need Whataburger on the weekends. Sometimes bro, we were you crushing need large Papa John's like bro. nightly. Like, I mean, <laughs> wait. Can, can they Uber Eats at the dorms? Can Uber uh, Eats get on? Ooh, are they allowed? Maybe? Are they allowed? I have no idea. Maybe. All right. I don't we got to put do it on their it, off time. RFI. Yeah. That. Yeah. I don't show RFI up at the dorms that. and smoke kids. Do you don't? show up? At, you used you show to. Up at, <laughs> you used to. Not on. Not on the weekends. I've never been. <laughs> like I got a life, y'all. Well, okay. So there are. There are. There at least have been instructors that may be, you know, getting a fight with their significant other or, you know, have had a really good time. And they're like, they got some buddies in town and they say, Hey, let's go visit some cones and may or may not have shown up in the dorms and, and flipped some beds and gotten cones out for a little PT session in the middle of the night. Maybe a little accountability, if you will. Maybe I will, uh, I won't retell the story. Worst smoke of my life. Easter Sunday. Uh, it was terrible. Trent, go ahead. No, no we're, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that. I, I think we should save that for a time when we, we don't mention names or places and, and just tell some stories for a different episode. I like it. All right. We'll, we'll put a pin in it and we'll, we'll move on. Um, so you are going to have time at ANS on the weekends. You can go two ways with this. I, I totally agree that you need to be able to go out, let your hair down, have a good time. I will tell you for every minute that you're not recovering, for every every meal that you're not uh, getting exactly what it is that you need, and especially sleep, that recovery sleep on the weekends, for every minute that you sacrifice, it's going to be an hour getting back into it. And you can tell from the instructional standpoint, from, from this side of the fence, you can look at a team on Monday and you can pull the, the, the dudes aside. You can go, dudes and dudettes, and you can go, hey. You guys were out late on Friday night or Saturday night, huh? You get you guys were not in like you guys were not sleeping appropriately. You guys were not eating appropriately. What did you guys do yesterday? Oh, uh, you know the dudes went out and they saw a movie and they did all this other stuff. But like, yeah, we can tell, um, and that's not usually a good thing. No, you got to take advantage of the time that you're given. You know, you had you had mentioned right time, right place, um, right equipment, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but you know, th- there are occasions where. Um, you know, the, the the cadre aren't ready to go or, or whatever because of waiting on something. Um, if you have an extra 10 minutes and then, and you haven't eaten or you'd need some, throw something down, drink some water, drink some electrolytes, mobilize in some way, like utilize that 10 minutes. The, the, one of the best things, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from, uh, old retired controller who was in Mogadishu had been shot did the Mogadishu mile. Right. Cause it, I know you two are tracking, but if you're not tracking, like go, go check out Black Hawk down. They, those dudes expected to go out, do a quick hit, come back. That didn't happen. And, and, uh, he told me cause he was one of my, uh, mentors going through. He told me you eat when you can drink when you can sleep when you can, because you never know when you're going to get a chance to do it again. So, Take that opportunity because you never know when you're about to roll into an hour long smoke session. Never I do have know. an update. Actually, we can't call it smoking anymore. It's called like operant conditioning now. I'm in. Operant I'm an early adopter. 
Oh, do you guys have you guys, have you shortened it to OC? Yeah. I'm about to go OC these students. You know why I like that? Because it's also OC spray, and that's yep. still mean. You and know what I mean? Hurts. And it does hurt. Like if you never, I'd rather take a tase than an OC spray. I'll tell you that all day long. All day long. You take a tase, yeah. you're fine. Ten minutes later, you're like, oh god, man, my, my muscles are a little bit sore. You take O spray, uh, the the good OC to the face. Forget it. That's an hour out of your life. How about that? And it's an and hour when you long. shower, and it, when it oh. runs down, it gets all over. You got yeah. the. You got to be careful about what you touch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dude, here's a fun, uh, stupid Aaron story. So the first time that we went through the gas chamber, no big deal. Take the mask off. And this is like the banana. What do they call it? Like banana something. What do they use in the gas chambers? It's banana well, it's not something. The, it's not the strong stuff. It's not the stuff that they crack open outdoors. It's like the little no, pup kind of no. thing. Exactly. They call it, yeah. It's banana something, right? So it's like an irritant, but it's not nearly as bad. Some people react really badly to it. I never have. It's because I've been tear gassed a couple times. Thanks growing up in Ohio. Anyway, uh, we get done with the this little like gas chamber experience, and everything was fine. And then uh, this is when I uh, did something stupid, which is how all my stories start. So I take the mask off and I'm time and I'm taking off the outer ensemble and just out of habit, I throw the mask in my mouth to hold it as I wanted to use two hands to take the rest of the ensemble off. And just then the instructor was coming up to talk to me and he, like it was a, she, so she made eye contact with me. I made eye contact with her. And both of us just like shook our head and immediately it was just like, bleh, like it was, I just got a huge, like right in my mouth. It was, uh, that was stupid. And I did and I did so well up until that she literally told me as she's like helping me like she she was she was really nice about it as I was puking on the grass in uh San Antonio. She was like, "Well, I was actually coming over to tell you you did really really well, but I think we'll hold that." And I was like, "Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Put a pin in that one too." <laughs> you know what? We're going to need to we're going to need to mark all these peaches. Mark these things we're talking about. All right, so <laughs> You never know when you're going to roll into operant conditioning, the OC. So you got to make sure you're eating, sleeping, hydrating, and that's your day. It, it seems like it's silly, but it's not. You're just there to perform day to day. That is it. Be there on time. And now we roll into, you get selected. So your one day where they tell you you made it, congratulations, your lifelong dream has been realized. Congratulations, you've made it to the top of the mountain, only to find that there are 10 more ridge lines that you didn't see, and you have to go climb those. So. Yeah, they throw a really big selected. party when you get selected. They're very happy for you. Lots of handshaking and hugs. And Yep. There's probably cake. Um, I don't know. Well, every once in a while, too, and I've heard this story a couple times, but every once in a while, somebody from the unit shows up at this selection, and they just take you right out. They're like, you're ready for team right now. <laughs> um, like, that happens. So that make happens sure you're on all 342nd when you get pulled over to the black side. Yeah. It did, yeah. The three forty second. For those that didn't know, there were a lot of detachments in the three forty second, and I got to be honest, they recruited straight out of there. Um, yeah, I mean, immediately in the Air oh Force, maybe six, God. seven months, and then you're man, you're out there, good job, man. gunning. That's the thing is, Dizzy doesn't know about that, and that's the problem. they don't. If they did, the terminal list would have looked a lot differently. That guy yep. got selected right out of slick. <laughs> I can't this verify is, that. This is trying to be such a, a productive episode. And it's, <laughs> it's a sarcasm on. level. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's so much sarcasm. I need a bag to carry it. But where would I get a bag that is nice? And, you know where I'd get it? Everly Stock. Where? I'd Ooh. get it from Everly Stock. You know what? And I don't. Trent doesn't have a lot of sarcasm. He could probably fit his sarcasm in the bando bag. It looks like a fanny pack, but it's not. That bad boy will, will conceal carry your weapon. It's got your EDC in it. It looks fantastic. And it's extremely low vis. So if you are from the terminal list and you want to stay extremely low vis, let's say there you are at the 342nd. They come into you and they go, listen, good job at this selection, but we need you on the teams now. No training course, nothing needed, and you're going to war. You know what they give you? The bando bag. They're like, you're going to need this. And the little trick. I think that's what, yeah. Dude, all joking aside, that little trick with the expandable scabbard, that thing blew my mind. I was like, because I have the switchblade. And I was like, oh, yeah, it looks exactly like a switchblade. And they were like, uh, nope, you can get a broken down M4 in this bad boy with the expandable scabbard. And I lost my mind. I called Mike directly. And I was like, first of all, how dare you that I don't have this already? How dare you didn't know that I want this? 
I've been hitting I didn't them even up. No, I wanted this. <laughs> I didn't even know. How dare you? Uh, Is there I'm a promo code for that though? There, of course, there's a promo code. Hit up Eberly Stock. Go check them out at eberlystock.com. Use the promo code ONES READY at checkout. It'll get you a sweet discount. It's ONES READY at checkout over at Eberly Stock. Tell them we sent you. They'll know. We're all friends. I actually <laughs> filled yeah. mine with Cardo Max because last time I hit them up, I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm running a little low on supply. And Sean, I think, to shut me up, sent me an obscene amount of uh, Cardo Max. So I actually you have drink to like, expand the scabbard to like put all my stuff in there. <laughs> But why do you why do you like Cardo Max so much? It's awesome. It tastes good. It's caffeinated, and they have the Hydro Max, and they also have the immune booster, so that in case there's like a a, a disease that's maybe not as bad as people are telling you about, you take that immune booster, you're you're gonna get right through it. So it, it'll just Golly, be like a cold, man. like a just a regular cold with the immune yeah, booster. It, it's like the okay. old, like you know, a lot of vitamin C and all the good stuff that you need to to stay healthy. So it's important. Would- would some people get it and not even know that they have it? I don't know. I think not Cardo the Cardo Max, Max though, because like when that shows oh, no. up at your door, you're super excited. Unlike the That's other it. things that you may, are. Or may not come through your life without yep. fanfare. Correct. And, uh, and yeah, so the promo code for Cardo Max is ones ready. Promo code for Eberly stock is OR10. OR10. All Maybe right. OR10 OR for Eberly stock. You got, guys, we covered, we covered a lot of ground there. A lot of ground. We did cover That's a lot good. of ground. So we graduated yeah. A&S, and now it's on. This gets a lot of attention, um, and I, I understand why. It's because it's arguably one of the most stressful parts of the pipeline, uh, and it's pre-dive. So pre-dive now, um, it's run a little bit differently. Again, everything's evolved, but guess what? It is still super duper hard. So unfortunately, your day-to-day should sound exactly like A&S. Uh, Trent, can you tell me the atmospherics? I've heard a rumor and I want you to, I'm going to, oh, no. we haven't talked about this before. I'm going to do it real time. I've heard a rumor that the focus on training at ANS and the course load is so much that they actually just focus on training and getting you where you need to be. Follow on second part of this question to the rumor. I've heard that if teams are just absolutely squared away, you're always going to get just absolutely destroyed, right? But I've heard of the squared away teams, they're actually just allowed to train for the first time in their pipeline. And if they do what they're supposed to, and they really get locked in, the instructors are happy to treat them like adults and just train. Is that true? Okay. First of all, when you've had like (laughs) decent instructors in the past, that's always been the case that if you're a squared away team, every team takes their lumps. But I I do think that they're there. We have been working on this cultural shift over, over time the last few years to, to post ANS. It's all about training, right? ANS is like, you're, you know, see what you got. And after that is, it is, you know, this is it. We have these goals that we need you to meet. And as long as you're doing the work and, and hitting all these, uh, you know, all these marks in the sand that you need to, to hit, then you're good. Then you're just training. And, and that's that, you know, when you, when you step out of line and you need to be put back in your place or, you know, military discipline and all that other stuff, you know, the cadre have the tools to uh, fix the team. But otherwise that, that is the focus is to, to get the guys, folks, the training that they need and move on in the pipeline. To answer your question, I, like I will it, say that that like that extra training or that OC, if you want to call it that, like okay, that's OC in the pipeline. But sometimes there are corrective actions, and that doesn't end in the pipeline. That will continue on at an operational unit because people need to be corrected occasionally, to include myself. But oh yeah, like I mean, there there are corrective actions that can be taken. Yep, and this this is a good thing. I can't believe we've never talked about this before, right? But in your career, I, I will tell you 100%, people have this vision of the military where everybody is just so super strict and locked on and whatever else. And then they think about soft and they think that there is just absolutely none of that military stuff and whatever. Listen, none of those are true. Neither one of those are true, right? You need to be able, especially, in, we typically say in our community, we have a flat organizational structure, meaning I can walk right into the chief's office as an E5 and go, Chief, this is messed up. I need you to fix it. And that chief is going to go, okay, me is the op soup at our unit. I don't shut my door for anything unless I'm changing. If my door is shut, it's going to be open in the next two seconds. And you can come into me. And I do. I have, you know, first lieutenants that come into my room and go, hey, you screwed this one up and you need to explain yourself. And I go, okay, here we go. The problem is, is when we, you think that that is the culture that you're in, Right. There is years that you have to take to what you know to turn that professionalism, turn that discipline up 
and when it's okay to turn it down. The easiest, the easiest way to do this is the first name thing. I call it the, you know, this is, this is what young people in the pipeline, young uh, team members don't understand. And then people that don't internalize these lessons. When you're in the team room and you're there with your friends 12 hours a day, sometimes, you know, months, years at a time, you get pretty familiar. An E6 is not supposed to be called their first name by an E5. Does that happen in the team rooms? Does it happen on target? Does it happen when we're working? Of course. Sometimes you need to get somebody's attention and it's easier to go, hey, Mike, than it is to go, ah, excuse me, Master Sergeant Thompson, uh, Staff Sergeant Brown reports as ordered. Someone is shooting at us. Like that just doesn't work, right? But people don't know when to turn that on and turn that off and they get too familiar. And that's when you have an E4 stand up in a briefing and go, uh, hey, sir, Mike, 2-2, two, two, uh, two, four. Uh, I was just talking to the, the officer that I work for, um, uh, Jimmy J balls and J balls was saying that you don't appreciate his leadership style. Like that's not appropriate y'all. Like you can't be talking like that in front of people. That's where you see your supervisor go like this. I want to grab you, snatch you up by the nape in the neck. That's what we, you, sometimes, sometimes people are like, the OC doesn't, you know, we got smoked for nothing. No, y'all got smoked for being too familiar and you didn't know when to lock it up and when you didn't. And you can see that it happens over and over and over again. And you kind of have to be revectored. I have to be revectored all the time. And like Pete just was saying, this happens further and further in your career in less and less instances, right? Because you figure it out. But there's always been that time where you kind of overstep the line and somebody will pull you aside and go, hey, um, you don't talk to me like that, especially in front of people. Like we, we have to show them that we are a professional organization and you can only do that by acting professionally. So you, you gotta, you gotta lock it up. You gotta figure out when's the right time for jokes. When's the right time for these things. If you don't think that happens, I was standing on the sideline, uh, when chief master sergeant of the air force bath, uh, some, at, kudos to her because you know every time she goes to a base she does all calls right and it's just she doesn't know the questions she's getting and it's just random people coming up to the microphone and sim saf bass um you know and whatever it is and she reacts so well but you can see the people on the on the sidelines that are just like you know like Oh my, oh, who's that? Who is that? Who's that super, you know? And it's just because it's some, um, like, hey, my, you know, my travel voucher hasn't been paid. And it's like, oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's so funny. And, and, <laughs> and you can see she act, she reacts. It's great, but she's just like, oh, okay. Well, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. And, you know, I'm sure the finance folks are, are getting through it. And have you talked to your supervisor about it yet? Well, no, and it, and you could just, I mean, you could just see the blood boiling from the people on the sideline. It's great. We had the same thing with the uh, uh, SEAC a uh, yeah. couple ago, uh, you know, uh, during 2013, the sequestration. Like mm -hmm. somebody's, somebody gets up and, I mean, it's rare that you get a chance to ask a question to SimSAF or the SEAC or the, the, the you know, and ask about tuition's assistance. You know, people right. are getting booted out of the Air Force. Pl pilots aren't able to fly. People aren't able to train. And you're worried about tuition assistance. Like, yeah. wrong time, wrong place, wrong person. Oh, yeah. You know, I, did, I did want to touch on that on the day to day, though, and, and communication is like what, because I was thinking about it, and I know I'm jumping off topic, but when we started talking about day to day, I was thinking, like, okay, I'm going to take this seriously and think about what happens actually at a team every day. And what happens is after PT, when everybody gets back to the team room, wh what do we do? We all start BSing. You know, like this, but it's like this communication. We're doing like updates from the command. Like, hey, did you hear about this? We're all telling stories. And as a young person, you can gain a lot of knowledge through that, right? Like just people sitting there telling stories, catching up on everything. The, the E6s, the E7s talking about what they heard from their commander or from the boss and all that other stuff. And so that communication, if you, if you don't have that type of relationship or you're not around your supervisor enough to like glean that information and figure that stuff out and have that like comfort environment where you can ask those questions, I think that's where that comes from. That's a, that's a supervisor problem. But I think for us in the team room, like it's, it's just, that's what we do. We sit around, we gossip like little girls sometimes. Um, oh, hundred percent. But there's like, a, there is no, there, there's goodness. Yeah, there is it. nobody that gossips more than a, a team of ST operators. 
I'll tell you straight up. Like they just one hundred percent. But you get I mean, like, but like you hear everybody's stories, you hear what's going on, everybody's in the know. And like yeah, the room and control sometimes needs to take place. Uh but but a lot of information happens in the team room. You know what I mean? It does. It's, uh, it does. Yeah. So the day to day, like I love how Trent, you were like, I don't want to get off topic. Trent, we haven't been on topic since we started Boo Boo. We just out here. We're just we're just talking about stuff at this point. I don't even know. Uh, but, I don't even uh, know what we're gonna call this episode. I, I don't even know either. It's just gonna be. We we're, still we're have gonna, an episode that we haven't released yet, and I haven't edited or uh, me or Freya hadn't edited yet, and I just have it labeled TBD because I have no idea what we're gonna call it. I have the no idea. I do love the guy. Episode. <laughs> I can't believe we're still. I can't believe we're still clean on that one. Um, so pre dive, and then we we started off on this tangent about hey, you know, the OC, the operant conditioning, that stuff is meant to drive a response. It's meant to show you like you did something. I didn't like what you did. Let's learn from it. Let's reinforce it, and now let's go on. And you're going to do that all the way through dive school because the Air Force dive school is no joke. And pre dive is the same thing. And it's it's really the first time A and S is a very controlled environment. You know, pre-dive, you can die. You can die really, really easily at pre-dive. You can die really, really easily at dive school. That's your first real exposure. And it doesn't feel like it because the training is so tightly controlled. And it's, it's listen, we've got, you know, decades of experience on being able to do these things with very few, very few mishaps. A um, couple of, no, you know, you know, both of the people that have died in in these mishaps because they happen so infrequently that those names are etched in stone. So, um, you know, to Major Adrian and um, and his family that he left behind and, and Keegan Baker, like we haven't forgot about you guys. But, um, you know, this is really the first time where you could pay a dire physical consequence if you're not paying attention and you're not locked on. So unfortunately, the day to day for for pre dive is, man, do it. And then we're 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 out. After that, you graduate. If you haven't already been picked up to go directly to SEAL Team 6, then you're going to go on and you're going to go to uh, Air Force Dive School. And um, we're going to actually do, I know we keep saying this, we got to get a dive instructor on. We don't, you know, we already did an airborne episode. We need to get some of these. So I think we should probably skip over those other schools and talk about the apprentice courses uh, just because like, you know, free fall school, what are you going to do? You're going to get up and uh, jump out of an airplane every single day until it gets uh, too windy in Yuma to jump. And then you're going to go on with your life and it's going to be tight. I don't know how you guys feel about that. That's good. Yeah. No, I dig it. I mean, what all I, I mean, what for real though, it, it's, there are some like, uh, was it coffee or die or somebody like that did a really good piece on military free fall school. Oh, right. It, it right, really right. is. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of information out there on it. I'm sure we'll get an instructor on here one day. It's just most people aren't really asking about free fall. Most people are asking yeah. about, you know, pre dive, yeah. dive, and that kind of stuff because the attrition rate out of free fall school is just not zero. Not great. There, there are people that right. fail for sure. There are people that fail. If you are unsafe in the air and you can't get stable, weather you guys, you're, <gasps> oh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you're not pulling when you're supposed to and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, you're going to get booted, but. Um, but I do I, think I only that, did that to be mean. <laughs> I don't think I, it I even affected Trent at all. I don't, all. Know. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care about them. I made it. I don't care about them. <laughs> um, I, I guess I will say the only thing that you're supposed to do in the pipeline, stay out of trouble. Yes. Oh Quit, stay out of trouble. You're going TDY. The government is going to give you a credit card and the government is going to say, here you go. Go spend money. Uh, you're good for it. When you get back, though, you're going to have to pay it back. You're going to be away from the flagpole. You're going to be with your friends. There's going to be like zero adult supervision. Like I, it always astounds me. Um, and it's only a credit to who we're recruiting and how we select them. But it always astounds me that there's not more problems because we just hammer you for 16. If, if all the way through basic, that's eight, eight for 30 months or 30 weeks straight, we're just hammering you in san antonio texas and then we're like okay good job go to panama city and don't screw up <laughs> i can't believe that there's not more people that just do not lose their minds but i will say as a cautionary tale don't waste years of training because of a couple nights or even a couple hours of bad decision making on the road in the pipeline it will just destroy you and you'll dm us and you'll tell us oh it was a one-time thing and we'll be like 
have fun waiting two more years to go back to go through assessment selection again. If that's they what you're let gonna you do. back in, because your if. 120 alpha may say like, hey, alcohol related incident or and then maybe you're screwed. There's Uber. Yep. Use Uber. Mm. Use and, and pay attention to what credit card or debit card, whatever you're pulling out of your pocket, because if you think that I can I can use this government travel card one time. I, no, they, they know every time you swipe that card, fellas, and they know where you do it, too. Uh, so, and I've seen people get called in and be like, Hey, this establishment, uh, doesn't exactly have food. Uh, why were, I mean, is there, is the rhino made of spearmint? Is that why, uh, it's named like that? Like why, what do they serve there? Is it a sort of an African themed place, the spearmint rhino? Everybody has been where you're going. You know what I mean? Like it's, there are no secrets. It's just so you know. Right. All right. So like, I haven't day. been there, but I know buddies that have been there. So just <laughs> I have. When you were like, everybody's been where you're going. I was like, the Spearmint Rhino, Trent. I don't. I have not been there. I made that up. There's <laughs> at least one E6 or E7 it. on your team that is like a professor on those matters, and all you gotta do is be like, "Hey, man, what's this?" And he's like, "Ooh, ooh, no, not for him. Yeah, like, that's where I go. <laughs> not for you." All right. So that gets us through the pipeline. And the apprentice courses are what the apprentice courses are. We'd be rehashing the same stuff to say, hey, you need to be focused on whatever. But this is this is it. This is when you get your beret. And now you're going to get to the unit. And we really wanted to talk and focus on what it looks like at the unit because it really has changed over the last probably year and a half for how it is that we train, how it is that we accept people, even who we accept onto the teams. There was a long time where you would never see a combat control five level not get to a unit, right? So there was a long time. I said that very unclearly. You would never see three levels get to the unit as a combat controller. PJs, we graduate as a three level and we get you right to the units uh, because we have a different training structure inside of the PJ community for so long. Combat controllers and special reconnaissance man would go to, uh, it used to be called AST, but STTS. So you get all of those advanced skills and you get, all of those five level items done. And when you get to the unit, you're a five level, you're a JTAC, you're qualified and you're ready to go. That's not the case anymore. So we're getting three levels into the unit. And what this means is, is it's changed the way that we've gone about what we call the Air Force Special Operations Force Force Generation Cycle or the AFSO 4Gen Cycle. Um, and that has actually changed the day to day. So, you know, for us, like, We'll take you onto the team and we just did it this week. You're a three level. You show up and your day to day initially is just get your checklist done. There is a million things. I know that you're a, a bright eyed, bushy tailed, square jawed special operator and you're just ready to crush it. I tell every single person signing into the unit, regardless of rank, take a month. Don't even think about coming into work for a month. Get your household goods in, get through this checklist, get how about you learn how to drive to work without a GPS? When you can do that, we'll start talking about where we're going to get, you know, what team are you going to be on and, and all these other things. That day to day is intensive in admin and not a lot of other stuff because you're just chomping at the bit. You want to get to team training. You want to go do stuff. And unfortunately, that's not the goal right then. You know, the goal your day to day when you first get to a unit man, just get your checklist done. Yeah. I mean, yep. Go no, ahead. Just, I'll just, go ahead and call on you, Trent. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Thanks for calling on me. First question of the day. Appreciate it. Uh, so we still go to STTS, right? But you're saying that you're seeing three level combat control and SR dudes show up. Folks show up at the uh, the units now. There's just because of, of of challenges in the pipeline and and training and all that other stuff. Post uh, stuff. That, that uh, is a true statement. So okay. we have a uh, SR three level thing is more because we just changed the CFETP. Trent, I don't know if you know this. Did you know SR just recently kind of updated their Who CFETP? Did that? Do you remember the 18 to 24 months that you spent working on this 12 or 14 hours a day? Nope. Okay. You just brain dumped it. Um, so <laughs> a lot of the SR three levels that we do have are products of that. And they're waiting on a line item or two to clean up. But we just started recently receiving three-level controllers out of STTS, and it's for a number of different reasons. It's 
training and there was obviously the shutdown. I can't remember what was the name. We'll get demonetized for saying it out loud. It was a disease. It was really benign. We shut the whole country down over it for no reason. I can't remember. Anyway, but there was a lot of training impacts that happened with that. So now there is a large backlog where no kidding you're getting, and it's not one or two line items. It's a solid amount of training that three level controllers need to complete in order to get that five level. So it's just started happening recently, probably last six months to a year. And I think it's going to fix itself, but it's forced the team to really circle the wagons and controllers. Like I said, they're not used to, you know, that, that three level training. We used to call it the puppy mill back in the day, like PJ three level to five level training. We had entire training shops that would just puppy mill and just train, train, train those three level items to get the PJs to five level. Cause it was so intensive. There was a lot of stuff that needed to be done, but that started happening at least in our neck of the woods for controllers. And I know that there's been a bunch of three levels that have gone out. So short yeah, I mean, answer. The, the plan yeah. is like the way the pipeline is designed right now, it, it is, you're not supposed to come out as a three level. This is just a, um, a result or a, a product of, you know, global situations and training and weather and aircraft availability and stuff like that. The plan mm -hmm. is you still, as a, as a CCTSR, you do come out as a five level. PJ is, is a little yeah. different. Um, PJ is not more than, it's a lot different actually, but whatever. You'll figure right. that out once you get to the, once you get to the unit and the pipeline. But well, and that's yeah. a, a good thing to, to hit on here too is the very first thing that we're going to try to get you to do. And, um, we're not going to talk about my personal feelings on this because I would organize the training a little bit differently and on my teams and, and troops I do. But the idea is right when you sign in and this just happened, we had a three level PJ sign in. He was there barely long enough to get his house set up. He got everything good. And then a spot for the combat team members course at the uh, 68th FTU. So there's an entire unit in Davis Monathan Air Force Base. And all they do is this combat team members course for pararescuemen. It's the same structure and it focuses on PJ like things for uh, the same as STTS does. So that advanced skills training over in Herbie, that is exactly the same um, sort of idea as what's going on out at the FTU. So you take your three level PJs and they get about 70%, I want to say, of their line items complete for five level. But you're right out the door. And our controllers, they're the exact same. Like the, the clock doesn't stop for those five level controllers that show up to the unit. You need JTAG training. You need to get to SOTAC. You need to get these things knocked out. And it's just off to the races. So you show up, you sign in, you get your cage. If you're not going on the road right away, you're immediately into training. Right. So the AFSO 4 gen that we talked about talks about it. There's four different phases. Right. I'm not going to tell you how long those phases are because we talk about deployments and it gets on the line of OPSEC. Right. Yeah. But there's different phases in the individual training phase that is meant for you to do all those individual things. Sometimes it's, you know, your professional military education. If you have to go to a school, if you have to do individual things for you, if we want to get you an individual certification, if we want to get you a pavement certification, if we want to get you advanced medical skills, those things that you're supposed to be doing as an individual. And about halfway through that, the troops are going to bring you together and you're going to start training as a team. So you're going to front load all of those individual skills as much as you possibly can. And at the very end of that phase, you're going to get together and you're going to start being like, okay, Let's establish this SOP. Oh, what new skill do you have? Oh, you're a sniper now. Okay, I need to change your position on the team. Oh, you're a SUAS operator. Okay, I'm going to change your position on this team. So you basically collect those individual skills, and then you're ready to dump them into the team. The day-to-day -day there, you are just grinding. It's a lot of TDY in that phase. And it's a, it's a lot of individual skills where you're working alongside teammates, but you're working on individual things like your individual combat marksmanship those medical courses that I mentioned, maybe going to a sister service school like RSLIC, um, which is the uh, leader's course, right? Um, there's a lot of things that you can do inside of that individual training phase. And out of the individual training phase, you then go into your unit training phase, which is your entire team. This is really, really awesome at the units right now because nobody, I, I, there's currency and there's proficiency, and I'm not going to go too far into this, we are focused on team proficiency. I do not care 
if you're if you're going to Africa and you're going to do a global access mission set, I really don't care when the last time you did a free fall jump was if that's not what people are asking us to do, you know? And I this is going to be in the comments. People are going to be like, oh, yeah. we have to be ready 24-7 to do everything. No, I, I get it. Just play my game for a second. That unit training phase, the teams are focusing on proficiency. I just got a brief, uh, a high-risk high training brief from two of our teams that are going to go out. They want to work up to unmarked, covert, offset of more than 10K hey-hos. And they had an entire plan for it. And we looked at, we're like, who's doing this? They're like, our team and our team only. There's no strap hangers. There's nobody else. This is just us. And we want to work these skills to be proficient at this by the time we get back. And the commander looked at him and was like, that is awesome. That is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Inside of that unit phase, that's when you're supposed to be just hitting the ground, running hard on what you're doing as a team, right? No more individual stuff, team focused events to get ready to, to when you end up taking alert, which is a little bit later. Um, I'll pause there, but I get all fired up about it because it's, it's know. day to day, but it's good stuff. But it is day to day, like is, 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 you know, kind of quirky and cheesy as we may make it like, okay, well, I'm, I'm in the office at zero seven hundred and, you know, and then I work out and stuff like that. Like breaking it down by the F so four gen is, is good because I don't think that we've done that before. And I don't think we're running on any kind of line with OPSEC, but I don't think uh, so. That's why I, I wanted to, so. I'm, we'll yeah, find out. I'm gonna, yeah. Some, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> We'll find so out what say we are regardless of whether yeah. it's true or not. Yeah, exactly. Well, because people don't understand what OPSEC is. But somebody uh, somebody sent me an email and it was like right on that line of like, hey, I think this might be a problem. I had like 75 emails when I came back from the weekend and I literally looked at the email and was like, well, if this is serious, somebody's going to call me into an office today. And if it's not, I guess I can just read this email and go on. That's the same <laughs> sort of thing right there. Like if we're close on OPSEC, trust me, we'll get a phone call. So... <laughs> Um, but the unit training phase is, is really, really good. It's something that I see training value in because even as a young person on the team, you might not be at the same level as everybody else. They're going to come down to your level to teach you, but they're also going to bring you up. And I'll tell you, this is just something that I'm so proud of risk management. Everybody hates doing it, but it shows that as a leader, you're thinking through all of these things. And one of the triggers for this last Hey Ho trip that I was talking about one of the triggers was we are not going to progress to this until our low, until everybody is competent, until I can look and make sure that they're safe. And then if they're not, we're going to take the equipment off. We're going to back it down. We're going to make it less complicated until we all get to this area. So their entire plan rested on those brand new three levels. And it was two three level PJs, their entire training plan that we spent thousands, ten, more than tens of thousands, just barely less than hundreds of thousands to send this team to the premier school with the premier teachers. And it rests on a three level PJ being able to do what they're supposed to. That is, I know that we, we joke around a lot, but that's where we expect you to be. And, and can I just say as a, the, the team leader on that iteration, if you think that it's easy for them to slow down and to not want to go to the next step, like that is not an easy thing to do. So when we talk about like at the lowest possible level in your training, putting your ego aside and doing the right thing regardless, and it's not all about you and, and looking cool and being that guy that's, you know, going to go to the black side straight out of the 342nd. Like that's what we're talking about. Like, cause the, those are the things that are going to pay off later on and, and make your team better and make your team safer when, when able, right. Before you go down range and actually do, for real dangerous stuff and you have less control. Mm -hmm. And it's that team training that, that lets you answer those extremely hard problems uh, for reasons that are going to become obvious. I have a friend that was working at a tier one unit. I hadn't seen him for a long time. And we were talking about jump currencies and we were talking about team training. And it was this sort of conversation of, you know, I want to build proficiency. I don't care about currency. I want you to be proficient. And he said, you know, Aaron, uh, funny story about that. I was deployed. I had a combat free fall and that was in February of this year. You know, he told me what year it was and I was like, okay, that's tight. And he goes, what if I told you I didn't get another free fall until March of the next year? And you know what that was? I was like, I don't know what a training trip. He goes, it was another operational free fall jump. And I was like, no way. And he was like, listen, 
it was not part of the training cycle. We weren't meant to go there, but they looked at the team and they were like, are you guys proficient? So there was almost, I think there was, maybe it was opposite. Maybe it was like less than a year. Maybe it was like 10 months or something in between. He's like, but I got this jump. I went and was I current? Nope. But was our team proficient? Yep. And they got, it was one of the bigger missions that's happened in the last 10 years. And it was, that's the difference between currency and proficiency. And that's what we look at inside of that unit training, right? As we get done with unit training, now we start, now we start paying a penalty because you're going to go to joint collective. And what that means is you had your individual training. Good. Individually, you're good. Then we worked on team. Well, now we're starting to get ready with our joint partners. And this is where we're going to go to any number of places around the world, India, Thailand, Nepal, Senegal, you know, any of the European countries, and you're going to do JSATs. You're going to train with your joint partners in the army and the Navy and other soft organizations, sometimes other department of state organizations. And you're really going to put it together and get ready to go. This is actually my favorite phase just because of the input that you get, especially up here, working with the second bat Rangers. Second bat's been fantastic. And first special forces group up here, fantastic. They come over and train with us really frequently. We train with them really frequently. We have the ability to work with the 160th. So that's really where, and it's it's funny how all this is kind of naturally tying together. Go back to you getting uh, operant conditioning in the pipeline for being too familiar. Well, that's because we're going to put you in front of the commander of the 160th and ask you to brief the AIE iteration. And you need to know when to lock it up. You need to know when to feel that little, like, you know, if you're a, uh, a pilot taught me this phrase, but if your backside is sucking up seat cushion because you're so worried about what's about to happen, that's the right feeling. <laughs> that That is an emotional event. The first time an 06 from the army looks at you and goes, okay, staff sergeant, air force guy. Wow. Me, you had better be trained because you, you'll be weighed, measured and found wanting. If you can't answer that call. <laughs> you're not wrong. Never, never heard that before. I had a, I had a, the first time I ever heard that, the most calm CW4 pilot was briefing me. It was a, a, at a school. So he was telling a story about how the, he lost his tail rotor on short final. So he's a 60 pilot. No kidding. At like 200 feet, uh, I believe by gunfire, his tail rotor almost just exploded just right away. And he was like, yep. And then from 200 feet, uh, I got to be honest with you. My backside was sucking up seat cushion. It was a pretty emotional event. And I was like, oh, my God, did you live? He did not find that funny, by the way, either. That joke. <laughs> didn't, that I am not flat. a comedian. No, it was bad. Yeah, it was in front. I should have gotten more operant conditioning in the pipeline to know when to not tell people jokes like that. And that's the lesson <laughs> of the day. I mean, but the, I, I love that point because the whole like staff sergeant in front of 06, because I have yet to see another group of people that that's normal for in the, yep. in the military. And it's totally it happens normal for us. So often and it's not, it's not you going to brief them about the barbecue that's happening at the thing. It's about life and death situations. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. You know? And, and it's like you said, those, you know, that army 06 is going to look at you and be like, good luck, dude, good luck, you know, passing this test, which is what it is. Every single day. It's an eval baby. Um, so oh, that's yeah, my favorite. Comfortable. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, <laughs> comfort is the enemy of progress. So you get done with that, the joint collective phase, right? So your day to day is you're living and working with your team, sometimes partner forces, sometimes, you know, in a, in a far flung nation across the world where you're doing joint combined exercise and training or JSATs, or you're doing an, uh, an engagement with one of your partner force teams. And, and this could be anywhere. You know, we've had teams that have gone to any number of places. I'd love to name them all, but I'm positive that I'll name one that I'm not supposed to. So I'm just going to go on with like, don't risk it. But don't risk it, baby. When you were naming <laughs> countries earlier, I was like, Oh no, yeah, I was oh, like, no. please. Uh, I know. Please stop. I know. I was, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was taking them off in my head. I was like, this one's safe. This one's safe. This one's safe. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just made up countries. Um, that was tight. Limited. Uh, <laughs> Listen, sometimes you're going to be working with your Atropian partners. Sometimes the Linnadians <laughs> want you to work with them. Um, Thailand is a great Lindens. place to visit. Some Jared Wakandans, has figured out like, the, the, 
the bleep button. So like you just bleep out all of these, all of these names. I, ca- I can't wait. Cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. I have, <laughs> I have, I have gone back through and gone like, uh, even if it's not <laughs> like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bleep this one out. Right. Listen, just cause it's on Google doesn't mean you can say it. Well, it exactly. means other people can say it. You know what? Yeah, you can't. I, yeah, I can't. Yeah, there's there's people that have an OnlyFans. Well, let's say stuff on there, but uh, it's whatever. I'm just going to go on with it. <laughs> hey, so, well, actually, I had written down a question. These are things that we get quite a bit. Um, the first one is is from me. The the job crossover during team training, you know, how much uh, crossover between the AFSCs. And one of the things that you actually answered was the sister service interaction because people keep asking, are we still working with our sister service folks? Are we still, you know, doing the enabler role and all that other stuff? So, um, I think you already covered that part, but like the, uh, the crossover between the AFSCs during the training, like how much of that is there? And, and it doesn't really matter that much, which AFSC you are depending on, on, you know, you know, like what you're doing on team. Right. I mean, no, it, it matters a ton, right? Um, it, you know, it, I'm sorry. So the AFSC does not matter at all. And the crossover, uh, we work all the time, you know, I, I'll post a, I'll post a short video after we get out of here, but uh, you know, I've, I've got a, a great photo of two guys doing DCP work. They're running, you know, one of the DCPs, uh, dynamic cone penetrometer. Pentrometer. Pentrometer. Okay. I always add an extra syllable in there. So close. I was a global access troop chief. No big deal. Hashtag. Um, but I have a picture of some people doing no kidding access work, not a controller in the picture. It, it was a PJ and an SR guy. And I have another picture of a mass casualty was happening and three people were working over in a corner directed by one person. Those three people were not PJs. Like that's what we need to do. We need to be able you need to know next man up. If the radio goes down, somebody's got to pick the radio up. Somebody's gonna have to be able to at least, you know, hold hold the dam together, as it were, um, until we can get this problem figured out. So we focus a lot on that. It's, and that's in unit training, right? It's, hey, the PJ, you, you may only have, some of the STTs only have one PJ. And if that PJ is taken up doing something else and there's a medical problem, all medical problems are tactical problems until proven otherwise. And everybody has to know basic tactics. So that that cross loading, um, you know, everybody knows how to fly the drone. We're not all yeah. qualified, but an extremist, we know how to get it up and get what we need. Um, and that's that's really important. And that happens in unit. And then I... I will address your joint collective of how much we're working with sister service while we're not doing the classic enabler mission. We are still out there. People still need us to do, to do things. It just looks a little different in how we force present those forces. So we're still working international partners, joint partners, everybody under the sun we're still working with. Right. But it's, it's not the one or two dudes and you don't see them for six months and they come back with a beard and you hear their story. That's, that's just not how we're doing business anymore. And, I got to be honest, like, like I agree with a lot of the way that we're doing business now. I disagree with with some ways we're doing it. But, you know, to answer your question directly, yes, of course, we're still working with joint partners and sister service. And we're still putting people on those teams for specific missions. Um, and it, it's exciting, honestly. Uh, I, I think people are going to get even more opportunities out of it. So you'd say you still love your job. I love my job every day, baby. Regardless, <laughs> no matter how, if you would have asked me Tuesday or Wednesday if I still love my job of this week. Uh, I don't, I don't know what I would have said. Uh, because it was, had to be it was a rough to, like, one. Speak English at that time was that Tuesday or Wednesday? Or? My my brain was fried. I typically, I, I think that I can handle a lot of things at once. I was proven wrong this week. Vegas, like, can't, I was, you can't handle Vegas. Listen, that was a problem. <laughs> that was that's that's for another episode. I set myself up for failure. You know what I was? I should have been doing focusing on my day to day not going to a live fantasy football draft with the closest PJ friends that I have in Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm-mm. Sounds dangerous. It got so ugly that <laughs> you were here for four days. <laughs> see you. We had, I we had see you recorded a meetup oh. and, uh, and that meetup never happened because <sighs> you so went bad. black on comms a couple times, bro. Um, episodes were released that, <laughs> Like, that was whatever. my favorite mistake ever. Uh, I, we distinctly talked about. I was just in the fight. I was in the fight. I was just like five meter targets would pop up, and I'd just be like, uh, "Okay, well, hey, I released it." And Peaches was like, "Oh, I mean, you scheduled it for this weekend." And I was like, 
No, I released uh, it. No, I I released it. Released it. He what was happened oh, was. Yes. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Well, can't put that GD back in the bottle, Aaron. Yep. You idiot. <laughs> um, Trent, what, what other notes you got? Because we're, we're kind of at the end, right? So we're going to button up the day-to-day. And we're going to button up talking about the fourth gen cycle by saying at the end of it, there is a phase called commit. And that's where you go deploy. Um, to our credit, our commander said this yesterday. One of you know, Peaches and I, we had a really close friend that pinned on Chief yesterday. Amazing. Uh, we've known, I mean, you've known him longer than I have, BM. He's, you've known him for more than 15 years. I think I've only known him for like 13 or something, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, but I think Trent knows him too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but it was more like we, we, in passing the, the deployment. And then, like, I saw him a few years back. He walked into my office and I was like, bro. Yo, so <laughs> yeah, he put on Chief yesterday. It looks the same, uh, and he still does look the same. He's exactly, and he's exactly the same person, which is hilarious. Um, but our commander, when we talk about deployments, we're getting ready to to, to deploy a large uh, portion of our force, and our commander is going to be the commander, which doesn't often happen. It's it's actually the first time that we're going to employ in this new construct that we're working with. And our commander, to his credit, he said, "A hundred percent of you here." I have to tell to calm down about trying to get on this deployment. Everybody here, the only thing they care about is they want to train for an entire cycle. They want to be left alone to get as good as they possibly can. And the second that they're allowed to go down range, they want to be on a plane. He said, you know, and this is not a shot to anybody else in particular. He's like a hundred percent of my problems with getting people on this deployment are happening outside of this unit. If I, if I open it up to you, if I looked at any operator here and was like, I, you can deploy, but you're going to have to be a, a IT system specialist. That combat controller would go, yep, I'm in. I'll, I'll, I'll learn networking. Out. I'll learn it. Yep. I'll, le- I'll go to whatever I got to. Um, so that's the goal, right? And that's, that's what you're here to do. You're here to deploy. You're here to fight and win on behalf of this great nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's what you came in to do. And the commit phase is where you get to go do that. All that hard work and all that training pays off and that's the commit phase and uh, the the day-to-day and i know we're wrapping this up in like the day-to-day and and whatever but that's the phases that you're going to go through so your day-to-day is going to change every single time it might be you know right when you first get to that unit you might be signing in and doing a checklist and you know x amount of months later you might be on a mountaintop in butte montana where you jumped into an unmarked ten thousand foot dz to do some winter work so, and, and you might be out there for two weeks. That might be your day to day, or it might be the very beginning of that individual phase and you're on block leave and you're doing computer-based training and you're getting all your currencies greened up so that you're ready to train later in that phase. It's just, I know that we joke around it, about it being different, but that's how we train to go to war because we are in the business of war fighting. That's what we do. So your day to day, if it's not getting after the business of war fighting, you can answer your own question. Did I did good or did I do bad today? If you if you're getting after the business of war fighting, you're doing awesome because that's what we're here to do. If you didn't, you can answer your own question. Seems like Boom. a good place to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say after that. <laughs> I was just I was waiting to to open it up to you guys. No, I was but... sitting here going like, well, um, we shouldn't even yeah, do an outro good, for this one. Talk. We should just cut the episode right there. Just like, J- boom. Just fade to black, the hard yep. the hard close. I don't yeah. know. I feel like we get this question all the time, and I know we poo-poo it because we get it so much. Maybe now, maybe now during the AFSO fort, like I, after talking about how we train and, and what you should be focusing on, maybe people maybe people will listen. Do you guys feel, you guys feel good about that? No? Well, okay. I'm going to put my plug out there. Can you guys please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review? We're so close to a thousand reviews on Apple. It's the only thing I've ever wanted. I just wish it would happen. Do it for Aaron. <laughs> don't say that. I don't know how you like take away reviews, but if you say do it for Aaron, we're going to go down to like 700. <laughs> They're going to be like... <laughs> I want to see specifically good... Aaron reviews. Review Aaron only. Oh, no. Actually, uh, you can, leave you can a do... five star. You can be mean. Just leave five stars. Don't leave one star. And then, like, you can be mean. I'll read it and cry like I normally do. Whatever. Or passive aggressively mention it deep in a podcast. Whatever. But please leave five stars. 
Yeah, you know what? We're the, at the, 991 right now. There's, there's nothing worse than is. three stars, I think, because mediocrity is what we we are scared of the most. Like if someone hates me, I'm like, eh. But if someone loves me, I'm like, okay. But if right. someone's like, you're like average, it's like, what? Ugh. It does uh, hurt a little bit more, doesn't it? Isn't that weird? What ti- yeah, what an idea. Like, you didn't make me feel any sort of way, right? Like, if, if you hate me, that's a feeling. If you love me, that's a feeling. But if you're like, it's like the meme with John Hamm. I don't even think about you. I, don't think I feel about you bad for you. I don't think about you at all. Yeah. How terrible. Ugh. Maybe more people should ignore me. Maybe that would really get to me. <laughs> three, three stars, y'all. Three, five stars. Quit it. And on that note, yeah. Thanks for watching. Later. See ya. Later.